Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar session on uh, the business model in the ag uh, value chain. I'll quickly introduce you uh, to the um, uh, speakers. Um, uh, you, most of you already know them uh, in a well. Uh, it's the who's who of uh, the, uh, in the investment world in the Indian ag ecosystem. Um, we have Karthik Reddy. Uh, he's the founding partner at uh, Bloom. Uh, probably the most uh, prolific investor uh, in the Indian uh, early stage investment ecosystem. Um, he's also just closed uh, the fourth fund, uh, upwards of $250 million. So um, folks who are looking for some checks uh, can ping Karthik, and he's probably sitting on the panel with the checkbook already. Uh -huh. um, we have Reham Roy, um, he's partner at Omnivore, uh, probably the most prolific ag investor in India. Uh, Reham has been uh, investing probably even before the word ag tech was coined way well before 2012. Um, so if someone who knows ag and tech and how both work together, uh, it's probably uh, Reham. Uh, Sudhir Rao, um, a founding partner at Celesta, earlier Warden Riverwood Ventures. Um, they've done some phenomenal investments uh, in India. Uh, he's been a pioneer in the capital markets the last 33, uh, 33 years, and also the founding partner at Carvey earlier. He used Matheson, uh, Director of Venturing and Business Development at Nutrico, um, probably also the Chief Strategic Officer um, at Used, but I'll leave that announcement uh, to Used. Um, he's done, uh, got some uh, good exit done in the Indian ag tech market, probably the first one um, by way of Airwaka. Uh, so congrats, Used, on that. Uh, so we'll hear more about that from uh, from uh, used. Archana Shivatsan uh, from the Gates Foundation. Uh, 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 she's been uh, looking at various segments in India. Ag is one of them, e farmer, ag tech, and many others. So, hope to hear a lot more about <clears throat> her views on how this entire space is going to pan out. And finally, Wamshi Reddy, partner at Kalari Capital. Wamshi is also a practicing farmer um, by, by the night or by the days. And then he also happens to be an investor. Um, so someone who's been a practicing ag uh, entrepreneur himself. That's so over to Wamshi uh, you know, to uh, trigger this interesting discussion and look forward to this. Thank you, Ranjit. Um, and thank you everyone for uh, being here. Uh, I think it's an interesting panel and uh, with uh, the stalwarts of the industry being here, I think uh, there's, uh, there's a great opportunity to kind of have a discussion around um, you know, how we can build, uh, you know, what is your thoughts on building sustainable models over here? Um, as we know, uh, Agri has been the, you know, largest contributor, uh, I can say, in terms of uh, uh, employment for the country, as well as, uh, you know, uh, plays a vital part in the country's economy, right? And, uh, you know, accounts for around 15% of India's GDP and a uh, uh, major contributor to the country's export earnings as well. Um, as we know, in spite of all of this, I think uh, the key critical thing always has been there's so many challenges that this sector uh, faces, um, which uh, includes, you know, low productivity, um, inadequate infrastructure, um, you know, limited access to kind of technology and markets. Um, so, uh, you know, we really wanted to kind of uh, brainstorm here to understand how everyone thinks and primarily because we have like uh, uh, you know, a bunch of investors here. I think it'll be good to understand their perspective. So maybe I'll start off with uh, um, Karthik and, uh, you know, try to understand. Uh, when I started, my own investment thesis was more on agri versus, uh, you know, actually thinking about agri tech as such, right? But, uh, you know, how does agri as a model work? And then, you know, it's evol evolution into the tech part because there are certain components which are purely agree, I would think always. And then there are certain components which I feel that, uh, you know, technology is going to start enabling and kind of reach uh, a larger point of penetration where it kind of uh, becomes, um, you know, more uh, integral part of the whole agri-tech environment. So, um, and this might be a question which, uh, you know, um, you know, again, uh, Karthik uh, um, and Rehim and uh, Sudhi can answer basically is, what is uh, the thesis uh, been when uh, you guys started investing in these models and uh, uh, you know how has it evolved over the period of uh, the last uh, uh, you know four five years uh, because we have seen tremendous amount of investments coming into the space um, and how do you see it uh, going forward uh, so would love to uh, get your thoughts on that Karthik, we can start with you oh, thanks 
So thanks, Akshay. No, I think, um, you know, in all humility, I think we are not, um, we're probably the sort of uh, least prolific specifically around agri. Um, Ranjit here, um, actually in Stellabs was our introduction to uh, the space. We were very tentative. We were sort of, we thought of this as a pre-2016, pre-GO. We heard of stories and of course, Omnivore has been doing this for 12 years. But I don't think we had the courage to step in and say that there were, uh, you know, problems at scale that we could solve without widespread penetration of uh, low-cost data infrastructure or low-cost infrastructure. If you really wanted to do something for that target segment, right? And I felt like if you're not um, inclusive of all the actors in, in that ecosystem, then it's going to be very difficult to actually do agri tech, so to speak, uh, as opposed to just a agri business model. The second, uh, at least the bloom bias on this uh, space is um, we see it more as an application area as opposed to a bread and butter, in that sense, right? Some, some uh, folks on this call, um, the, either for strategic or, um, or impact or agri focused reasons, that's bread and butter, everything, jam, everything that they do. For us, I think we're spoiled for choice as a generalist tech VC. And from our lens, um, if you're a generalist tech VC, then you're competing with uh, a fintech deal or a deep tech deal or a um, or a SaaS deal on a particular uh, in a in a particular given Monday where there are competing ICs. And so the lens that we apply, uh, rightly or wrongly, is um, bringing that learning on whether this is a a fintech model applied to a agricultural business or a value chain, um, just as you would apply a financing to education or financing to um, commerce or financing to an SMB. Um, and we see the other lens I think we have uh, broadly hell-bent on applying is agri is probably the most interesting SMB market uh, of this country, right? So we don't see, you know, agriculturalists or uh, individuals as uh, uh, retail uh, or as consumers as much as we see them as folks who need to operate like an SMB, right? Um, and at least given that those 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 lenses were always on, what we've what we've taken comfort on is understanding end-to-end -end value chains and seeing whether the application of uh, technology to them makes those value chains for, far more efficient. So in the case of Stellabs, uh, as an example, since he's on the call here, for us, it was the fact that you went into the most well-organized crop in the country, which was milk. And then you were essentially, you know, extracting a part of that uh, value out of the milk value chain. We, could, we tried to replicate that in multiple other sort of crops, and we really didn't get comfort to go deep, let's say. Uh, whereas if we look at our play in Jekasan, it is more of an application of is there an insight that allows you to be at point of sale of an agri, uh, you know, agri e-commerce and then not actually go and reinvent the wheel or not go to the farmer, which we didn't think was a model or not go to the, um, and not go to simply trying to become a retailer yourself, but actually sit at the point of sale and, and be a more efficient, um, you know, uh, agri financier. So I think our lens is when we're looking at agri, we're looking at, is there a deep differentiated, um, moat that or a or an insight that the founder brings, which gives them an edge over anybody else who's going to blindly try to replicate it. Because it's a super fragmented market in this country. And so, you know, if, if they think you're somewhat successful, 10 other guys will try to copy it, you know, uh, with a, with a half-fast solution, pardon my French. And therefore, you know, it's, it's not in the long term, it's a long game because you can't go and carpet bomb the whole country and win over every part of the market. Uh, it is by design the most fragmented, uh, you know, market in the in the country. I think anything that you touch in agriculture, um, and uh, and therefore um, we've been very cautious on what we've played. So even the one deep tech play we've applied, we've we've seen is is it applicable only in the Indian context or is it global? And I know you have a whole bunch of questions around this, so I'll take a pause and I'll I'll answer the relevant ones where I have an opinion. Uh, based as the questions you've asked around whether it's software, hardware, business models around it. So this has been our approach, Abhishek. I hope that's useful. Thank you. Thanks, Karthik.
Uh, Sudhir, uh, you know, again, you know, continuing on that discussion, obviously, you know, uh, an interesting thought in the in the sense that, you know, how you look at uh, different things like Arthik is saying, he, you know, uh, the way you look at it is, you know, is it a model application which we are doing it in a different segment? Do you look at it from thinking that this is like any other SMB which needs to be exploited with uh, tech, you know, processes, uh, efficiencies across the supply chain, um, or do you look at it uh, as, a, as a pure deep tech play, right? There's so many elements within the whole supply chain, you can think of it and think of it very differently. And uh, fortunately, uh, I think uh, across India, we have this opportunity across different businesses where, you know, this kind of uh, uh, solutions need to uh, be provided. So, your own thesis and thought on how you look at the space and uh, is it again you know coming back to the point is it tech or agri because you know i'll come to rahim where i know that they start off from agri and then tech and but they are more general generalists in that sense from an agri tech standpoint or agri standpoint right so how do you see uh, sudhir sudhir i think you're on mute yeah sorry so I said at Celesto, we have two sort of very broad understanding, the way we think about technology. One is core technologies that are needed in the world now for actually uh, emerging applications. You know, the, the let's say autonomy of cars, they, the current technologies do not support that architecture. And therefore we look at uh, making investments in core technologies that are going to drive an emerging application. In the other lens we wear is, We've got existing, if I look at the $100 trillion GDP, it's structured into multiple segments from the resource to the consumer. And everybody's playing some piece of that, right? But if you take an industry horizontal, horizontally, you can look at that as a value chain. And this, I think, is very appropriately talking about value chains. Uh, and then you can prefix it as an agri or construction, or you can name any area. But these industries require transformations, right? So they need transformations in the way capital is deployed in the way capital is run, the number of turns you can get, the sort of margins that you can drive. And you're thinking at the same time, demand fulfillment and the entire resource base that's required. And if you look at F for food, you know every element is suddenly the letter F sort of, exp I, I experienced F and it needs a, a full-fledged transformation from an F grade to an A grade, right? So if you think about it, it's the farm, the farmer, the foliage, the forestry, the fridge where you finally land up putting all the stuff inside for extra shelf life. Uh, you have fertilizers, you want freshness. And if you think about all this language that we use when we are actually saying, this is finger looking good, you're actually thinking, you're not thinking, how did it come? And I think for us, Telabs came up as a phenomenal opportunity to take a look at an industry transformation, right? So you can look at this industry and you had a bunch of high quality engineering folks who could think system, who could think, how do we deploy in order to make a transformative change in the margin pool, in every element of it. And I said, across the Fs, you could actually start to think about all kinds of pieces of technology. So one is of course at the app layer, somebody's consuming it, somebody has to access it, somebody has to use it every day, whether it's uh, in their own lingua franca or whichever ways. Deeper down, I remember when they started out, we needed to put, just communication technology, because there was no communication capacity in some of these rural areas. So you need communication technology. There was operating technology, right? So you're in the farm now, you need certain sets of operating technology, and those don't exist. So it's a combination of operating technology, communication technology, uh, business technologies, and then ultimately the consumer experience, where either it's the farmer who's experiencing it, but now tomorrow with a QR code, the consumer is, is, is experiencing traceability and getting a trust score coming out of that. So it's a stack of technologies, some proprietary to the player who's playing it. But I think even better is the fact that we're living in an ecosystem world where lots of good stuff going on, all leverageable because it's interoperable. Uh, we have a mindset which is very different from being single chain. Value chain thinking, I think, is its time has come because you want to reconstruct 100 trillion. And a piece of that, of course, is food. I mean, if you look at the lower per capita income countries like ourselves, then 40% of our money is on food. And if you go up the chain, you know, where you're doing $50,000, maybe you're not spending so much on food, but you're far more sensitive about where is it coming from? How's it been treated? You know, and I'm much more sensitive about 
even that little bit that I might spend, whether it's 5% or 10% of my wallet. So from those, for those who it matters, it's 40%. For some people, it's five to 10%. So in that range allows us to take a full spectrum view. And I think that's what excited us uh, to look at the sector. And in that sector, we can take on more questions. How do you slice it? And like Karthik said, for us, it was an atomic unit called milk. It was easy, you know, it was easy to manage. Everybody calls it a liter of milk. Nobody calls it as a kilo of milk for whatever reason. But what we trade is kilos of milk because there's fat inside it. And what Stellab starts to do is actually convert from volume, the metric itself shifts to weight and the whole discerning buyers start to think differently when they eat milk rather than drink milk. So that chain that I think that entire possible exposition, if you may, uh, in agriculture, and you know, we all live on food every day. So, and I love my, I'm a foodie myself. So my access to was like a consumer, but when you go down deep, there's a lot of stuff you could get done. Great. Um, so, you know, one of the things we keep talking about is, you know, obviously, uh, if you look at the kind of technologies that can, you know, be uh, be a part of the whole value chain, right, are, are uh, you know, providing a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, if you look at want to really improve the efficiencies in the whole supply chain, right, there's, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the stuff which still apps is doing here is, um, you know, there's, there's just when, you know, you're talking about location based technologies, uh, you know, where farmers can track and manage their crops or sensors, uh, like what we were discussing, you know, of uh, monitoring technologies, which can collect farm data, soil moisture, temperature, pH levels, and all that stuff, or, uh, you know, robotics and automation within the farm, predictive analytics and machine learning, which can help farmers analyze large amounts of data to make informed decisions and all that stuff. But the overall, you know, you can see that there is so much opportunity within all of these, right? But when you really look from a business perspective, right, you know, what are the things which we think that are actually very, very fundamental to start with, right? And, um, you know, this is where I want to come to Rahim to say that, hey, you know, if we are starting off from an ad to a tech, how would you look at an evolution across the value chain? Because I know you have done investments across the board, right? Uh, and across technology and non-technology, just value chain or uh, efficiencies in uh, processing or efficiencies in automation, um, or just in the supply chain side or on the input side, there's so many of our investments are in this space. So would love to get your thoughts on, you know, when you look at it, you know, how are you seeing this? How are you seeing, you know, what is happening right now? And uh, from where you have uh, started uh, investing to, uh, you know, how do you see this evolve into um, uh, becoming a part of, uh, again, you know, I'm coming back to the point that how much of this can actually become bigger and bigger uh, yeah. in terms of technology. So listen, I think um, first we need to sort of lay the foundation here. Um, this is a sector that employs uh, a third of our population. It contributes significantly. If we just look at um, what Stellaps is dealing with, milk, which is what we're talking about, that's 4% of India's GDP right there. There are very few sectors, forget commodities, that can claim that kind of might. <laughs> And yet we haven't seen a um, hundred solutions uh, emerge in the space like we have in e-commerce, like we have in ed tech, like we have in mobility. And I think the, the reasons uh, for that are that the problems in, in unlocking value in the sector are quite fundamental. Um, agriculture, whether it's dairy, whether it's any other value chain, um, it, could be, it, it could be fruits and vegetables, it could be grains, it's always the same story of um, a point of production and a point of consumption being very far apart. And then multiple, many, multiple doesn't begin to cover it. Hundreds often uh, layers in between, all trying to, to sort of extract arbitrage essentially from information asymmetry. And that information asymmetry is rooted in the fact that public infrastructure is not the strongest in the space uh, digital penetration is is often weakest in this space, and and this is is in many ways what results in the inefficiencies. Um, let me take a very specific example. Since Ranjit is on the panel here, we have we have milk, and we have we have a hundred million stakeholders in the Indian dairy industry, 
80 million of them are actually dairy farmers managing 300 million head of cattle. And it took an innovation, um, a smart collection center that could evaluate milk in real time to incentivize farmers to actually breed, uh, to, to actually produce better milk, to feed their cows um, better inputs. And this is where technology plays a role. If you don't have a means to incentivize people to, to improve the quality of their produce, they won't improve the quality of their produce. If you pool milk from 500 users into a massive BMC and the, into a bulk milk chiller and then evaluate the consolidated collection and say, this is today's quality, this is today's price, why would an individual farmer be incentivized to feed his cows better, to treat his milk better and to ensure that the quality of his milk commands top dollar for the simple reason that he's, he's not able to interface with mar market dynamics. So in many ways for us, if I look back at the early days, 2013, when I was out there with Ranjit, we were driving around in his Honda Civic, um, <laughs> trying to discover what, what would work and what wouldn't. I think the fact that a farmer could come with his pail of milk and in real time know that his milk was not just its weight, not just its fat, but know about other aspects, know how to improve it and actually be rewarded for that. Um, being rewarded for that doesn't come out of a technology innovation. Being rewarded for, for performing better as a farmer involves institutional change. It means dairy companies need to recognize that, that incentives need to exist. It means that consumers um, need to recognize that you need to pay better for higher quality and safer milk. It's, it's change that occurs across so many different stakeholders um, that only tech can enable that. Um, Coming back to my earlier point, the, the, the challenges are so fundamental. Um, how do you get rid of the information asymmetry that allows for the middleman culture that exists in India today? How do you build platforms that allow people, that allow production and demand to talk to each other in real time? How do we actually end a situation uh, which is unique in many ways to India and other smaller developing nations where a bumper harvest spells doom and not success simply because there's no way to connect um, demand with your bumper harvest, right? So for me, tech is about enabling that. It's about getting all these stakeholders talking to each other in real time, incentivizing good behavior. I remember I used to refer to when I used to talk about Stella apps to, to, to other investors, I used to say Ranjit ensures the integrity of the dairy supply chain. And in many ways, it was that. Um, for the first time, there was a watchdog in place and that watchdog was tech enabled. So again, it's, it's really about bringing stakeholders together and using tech to allow them to talk, to incentivize each other. Um, and, and whether it's milk or any other value chain, I think that's what's gonna unlock value. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, um, so, so one of the things is while we talk about tech, uh, you know, it it really becomes uh, a little more challenging on how exactly you take tech to the uh, to the farmer or across the supply chain, and you know that's where we talk about, uh, you know, what is the software component, what is the hardware component, are people willing to play uh, pay for a software or a hardware until they see the value in it, right? And uh, you know, obviously, we have seen some great examples here of Silaps or um, Eruaka, basically, where you know they've shown that there is a solution which actually people are willing to pay as long as you know, it really comes with, uh, you know, something which you can actually have a measurable, uh, you know, output, right? So end of the day, it's really about, uh, you know, how you're improving the efficiencies, uh, whether it's uh, on uh, from an input standpoint or improving the farm profitability uh, sustainably. So I think, uh, you know, um, this is where, you know, uh, we, you know, Eruaka, if you look at it and uh, even still apps, I think I've gone to show that you know you can actually build a, a software and a hardware layer. So, um, Josh, uh, you know I I would like to understand from your perspective, uh, you know how are you looking at it and what are you seeing uh, 
um, you know, um, the kind of models, uh, you know, of course, India is a very different market and uh, what we have seen with Celaps and Irwaka. Um, but what do you see as uh, the key components which can actually kind of uh, trigger uh, growth of these uh, adoption of technologies like uh, like what we are seeing um, get scale uh, in a in a in a in a shorter time frame? Uh, you know, I would love to understand what you think about that. Sure. Um, many aspects to that question, right? And I think compared to some of the um, uh, the, the the prolific inv investors on this panel, I think we we take have a slightly different perspective, of course, as a strategic investor, right? For us, the the ag tech part is is almost non negotiable, right? We invest only in the future of protein and only in the future of protein production, so we're we're quite upstream focused in that. Um, we do so on a global basis, right? We have invested, you know, in in two Indian companies, right? But for us, you know, the more relevant aspect uh, uh, of this discussion is also why India, right? And I think you know we see many opportunities in India as a country, um, partly because of what was already referred to, um, you know, the market, right? The 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 population that you have, the supply chain that you have, um, the demand that will only increase for all forms of of protein, uh, right? I think that's that's very relevant. Um, uh, that's why it's an attractive market for us to, to play. And I think Celebs is a testament to um, our investment in Celebs is a testament to that. I think the other part is the technology that's there, right? I think compared to other places where we invest, um, there is such a pool of talent and technology to tap into uh, where people are creative, have um, you know, skills, capabilities that they can leverage in a, in a, in a unique and innovative way to um, uh, you know, develop solutions that are not being developed elsewhere. Um, plus, I think there's um, the topic of inefficiencies, right? I think, it, and that maybe goes to your point, uh, Ramshi, about why not agriculture business, right? Or agribusiness investment, but ag tech investments. I think the agricultural chain across the world is rife with inefficiencies, right? And India has no exception, right? Uh, I think there is a, a large extent of inefficiency in, in supply chains, right? the, the, the middleman problem that was referred to before. I think, um, you know, that's, um, uh, if you can point the right technology, right, in an attractive market uh, to address the real inefficiency, right, then you're on, you're on, you're, you're, you're on, on a path towards um, something interesting. Um, that's something that we saw with 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 Eruvaka, right? To to highlight that example for us, that's less of an Indian application. It's more of an Indian uh, technology play, right? We took that technology from Pijawaya, right, to uh, Ecuador, right, where uh, shrimp is farmed on a, on a different scale than it is in India, right, and that was a hand in glove fit, right, there, um, it was about taking that tech that was developed in a very well, frugal, uh, effective, uh, innovative way, right, and to deploy it in a different context, where actually the value is much higher than its, you know, it, it's, its home turf, if you will. Um, the reason why we could scale it, right, is quite simple, it works, right, it solves an inefficiency, so rather than underfeeding shrimp as as farmers had done before they could start them start to feed them um at the required amount boosting growth boosting profitability shortening cycle time therefore uh, enabling more harvest per year right and it helped also as a as the b2b outlet of this technology it helped our commercial proposition um so um i think solving the right inefficiencies helps right but then you have to prove that it works right? and i think that's I think really encouraging part about Stell Labs, right? Um, business model wise, um, it's far more ambitious, right? It's not a single solution for a single problem for a single market, if you will, right? This is trying to transform an entire value chain. Um, it also requires for Stell Labs for Stella to be successful, it requires winning the hearts and minds of millions of farmers, right, across the country, um, where there is all kinds of infrastructure in place. The the, the barriers to to overcome on that F, right? It was, I don't think it was in Sudir's list yet, but a very important F in all of food is the F for farmer. Um, that's that's a huge obstacle to overcome. Uh, not to mention the intermediaries and the, and the middlemen to be, um, um, you know, made more efficient or to left out of the equation. But if it can work, right, it's transformational because um, the promise of uh, enabling farmers to be more productive uh, at a higher quality and therefore more profitable, while at the same time optimize the entire integrity and efficiency and quality of the supply chain, right? Offering better value to consumers. That's that's even more transformational than just one in one intervention on the farm level than the Irvaka was doing. So um 
it's more ambitious, I would say, to try and target those solutions. But especially in a market where India, like India, where the number of farmers is that uh, that sizable, um, the level of um, the farm size at an individual level is quite small, and the existing infrastructure is not in place. Right, I see lots of potential for these type of more value chain um, uh, interventions um, targeted at uh, really addressing, um, uh, you know, improving the economics of the entire system. Um, if you, it, it's harder to get it right, but I think the the returns are are very attractive if you're if you're managed to do so. And I think you know, Steps as an example is on a very encouraging path to do so. And I think there's some more models that we see in not in India per se, but in markets like Indonesia, for instance, also in the aquaculture value chain with a company like eFishery, where they find a way to create some kind of a network effect and increasing returns um, by um, uh, orchestrating the value chain in a much smarter way, enabled by, by technology, right? They're not just solving the problem of an individual farmer, but rather of an entire ecosystem. Um, I think uh, this is another example to, to prove my key point, right? I think you have to find technology and point it at um, an efficiency that's really worth solving, right? And then consistently prove that you can solve that inefficiency in a way that is attractive for um, your customer um, and the ecosystem around it. And I think both Irovaca and Celebs, and, and I think uh, uh, no doubt many other Indian active solutions out there uh, are, are proving just that, that it can be done. And um, you know, we're very um, uh, excited to be part of the AgTech evolution in India and continue to look to, uh, uh, to invest in interesting opportunities there. Thank you. Um... Let me come to Archana. Sorry for uh, coming uh, to you at the last, uh, Archana. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of set a context before uh, uh, coming to the question I have for you. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, India has a large growing population, and you know, addressing food security and nutrition is is a very very important part of this country. And uh, you know, ensuring that uh, this population right has access to uh, you know, sufficient, safe uh, food is is a, is a very big uh, challenge, right? And uh, we see that that is major, major issue uh, with uh, uh, the kind of uh, adulteration that happens and uh, the kind of uh, uh, access to food uh, or the wastage that happens. Um, so, you know, how how do you think? And you know, obviously, when you are looking from an investments perspective, how do you guys think? Uh, you know, agri tech can uh, you know provide solutions that can help improve. Uh, you know, both the quality and the availability of food, right? Uh, you know, are we looking at, are you looking at from a perspective of, um, you know, technology of precision agriculture, which can, uh, which can solve some of these things, or are you looking at, uh, you know, food processing technologies, um, you know, just want to understand what you're taking on, on the spaces and how you look at, uh, uh, when you look at things from an investment perspective. Yeah, thank you for that. And apologies if you hear some background noise. I just moved to a place that's right next to the tube line. So there may be some interference. Um, so overall, um, you know, on the ecosystem, Agri is just a no-brainer for us. Um, at both kind of within Agri um, crops as well as livestock. So dairy and other crops are uh, across South Asia. So Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Sub-Saharan Africa are I think given the state of the ecosystem, the importance of the economies, um, the contribution to global Food systems, uh, at the agri space is a no-brainer. For us, our investment thesis in India has centered around what if, what if, what a few folks mentioned on this on this uh, webinar already. One on addressing information asymmetries in the ecosystem, um, and two helping to improve kind of access to markets, access to quality quantity food. So essentially, everything around food security in the ecosystem. Um, I, I the overall, I think two investment approaches we've had or kind of two lenses through which we look at any investment. One is given the way the ecosystem functions and everything that's broken in the ecosystem, um, are there solutions, do the solutions address uh, concerns for multiple stakeholders in the ecosystem or just one? If it does not address concerns of multiple stakeholders in the ecosystem, for example, farmers, the lenders, the insurers, um, agri-businesses that procure from farmers, et cetera, all in one bucket, um, then is it really solving a key problem? And is it really gonna be able to scale? So that's kind of one, one key aspect that we look at. That's why crop in as an investment was interesting for us because um, while it's addressing information asymmetry to, through things like precision agriculture, it's not just solving it for the farmer. It's solving it to enable eventually 
access to finance and access to insurance and lending and um, the better visibility for the entire value chain for, for the farmer through that solution. Um, so that's one. The second is, does the solution provide incremental innovation or does it actually solve the root cause of the problem in the ecosystem? That's where something like Stellaps was super interesting. Uh, while it while it helps to assess kind of quality and all of the things people spoke about, um, it's also addressing kind of a structural issue in the ecosystem that's not just a good to have, but a must have for the value chain to perform better. So that's two lenses that we kind of evaluate any investment with and, and in future what we'll look at. From that lens, things that become interesting to us are everything that happens on the farm and everything that needs, everything that enables kind of post-farm uptake. So everything that can help improve productivity, um, advisory, kind of better efficiency, farm profits for the farmer, and everything that can help kind of post-farm, whether it's access to capital, whether it's access to markets and that entire value chain. Um, from that lens, I mean, there's super interesting spaces that have been, you know, up and coming for a while now in India and more broadly in South Asia as well. Things around quality assurance, um, whether that's through, um, whether that's through kind of robotics, AI, automation, um, on field and off field, whether it's through kind of quality assurance techniques in post farm chains. There's a lot of innovation that's coming up there that's interesting for us um, to look at. Um, from a few food security lens, uh, I think we're, we're also involved kind of as investors with, you know, I don't like to use the term blended financing, but for lack of a better word, kind of structured financing solutions that help assess uh, that help uh, try to solve for food security. And so can we use innovative um, guarantee or buy down structures to enable access to, let's say, therapeutic foods uh, and supplements for low income people? And that's, kind of, you know, that's working at a more structural issue in the ecosystem with kind of multiple donor funders. Um, that's aside from equity investments. So broadly, that's kind of the lens we've taken to investments in this space. Um, I wouldn't say that we've thought about food wastage itself, uh, but um, innovations like precision agri and innovations like it, that it help address the information asymmetry in the ag ecosystem are super important because we've always believed that Unless everyone in the um, in the value chain understands what is happening on the farm, they would be unable to support needs of the farm. And so, whether that's a lender, whether it's an insurer, whether it's an agri business, that's that's kind of the structural issue that we're trying to solve for through these investments. Yeah, and uh, you know, coming back to I think uh, one of the key things which we wanted to discuss uh, around is uh, you know uh, models and you know are they sustainable? Uh, you know whether it's tech or across the supply chain, are there enough margins within the supply chain um, where you know actually can create uh, opportunities for a business model to exist? Um, Karthik, coming back to you, um, just want to understand. Of course, we talk about um, you know whether it's B two B or B two C. We have we have, we've spoken, we've seen a lot of companies talking farm to folk um, but uh, again we know the challenges that exist in terms of doing farm to folk at scale um, uh, not just from uh, you know customer acquisition I would say but it's more from just the logistics part of actually managing this uh, farm to folk model uh, you, you know while everyone in the world seems to be moving in this direction that you know that is going to be real and there's opportunities to create large margins over there um, but the focus primarily uh, for India I think has been to see uh, you know, um, um, look at B2B and see how we can bring efficiencies within that supply chain and, uh, you know, see if we can actually create a uh, proposition for uh, increased margins. Um, uh, how do you look at it? You know, when you are looking at, uh, you know, of course, we, we look at so many, um, you know, um, different op opportunities and approaches towards solving these problems. Um, what is your take on uh, someone who wants to build a sustainable model, is it something you think uh, uh, they need to start off as B2B or uh, B2C? I know it's a completely different aspect thought that, you know, yeah. you do B2C or B2B. So what would you think, Karthik? Yeah, no, I think, um, I, I, I think I'll pick the latter, uh, the former, which is basically, I, I would like to believe that most problems have to be seen from the lens of an enterprise customer. Um, though I classify, as I said, uh, anybody, anybody, and everybody in this segment is at least an SMB. That is, uh, I don't, I don't, I, I don't necessarily enjoy the uh, 
uh, end state consumer consumer play um i feel that becomes like any other retail slash branded play uh yes it could be in the area of food but that theoretically could be in apparel i put it in those buckets so for, for us we we put food as a category um if it if it's actually as touch the end consumer consumer then i see it more of a, a brand retail play not necessarily an agri agri play um it's a it's, it's the same set of supply chain logistics uh, payments delivery problems that you have to handle um so when it comes to actually the, the agri problem so to speak i feel like if you're not solving it from the enterprise lens then you're not be you won't you won't have a uh, uh someone sponsoring the solution at scale right um and so if if even even when we're looking at let's say uh, a weeding technology or spraying technology we are finding that it is driven by the input uh, giants in that space not necessarily the individual farmer right so someone who has an interest in how the input in that into that crop uh, or in, in into that uh, into that layer uh, that we, there's a there's a investment called tartan sense we share with uh, uh, omnivore as well um that it's driven by those motivations rather than trying to solve it at a individual farmer level uh same thing with financing right so if if they the folks selling the goods are not interested in finding a mechanism to do vendor financing you actually don't have a product in my humble view right um and so i think the uh, wherever we have applied ourselves to agri we've seen that the interesting scale problem to solve is b2b and then everything flows from there so that's my take on b2b versus b2c or smb um sudhir so um you know obviously you know yesterday we were talking about uh, you know is, is there a merit in doing a, a full stack model right because you control all elements of the all the uh, supply chain or uh, create a value proposition right so um, but you know of course it comes with its own challenges right there is a merit in building a, a full stack solution but uh, there is a there's also challenges with actually kind of uh, the kind of uh, investments that are required in trying to solve multiple problems across the full stack right so um, and so the question more is around uh, you know is there full stack is a good approach and second is if we do a full stack approach is it something which you think is replicable across different uh, uh, you know uh, commodities whether it's milk silk wheat uh, you know cotton or anything like that right um, so is this uh, helpful to kind of go with that approach or do you think it's more about you know trying to solve a particular part of the uh, the stack sudhir you are on mute sorry that's a great question so but you know when the, when you language it as a full stack there's an assumption that this is technology uh, full stack could mean people could mean process could be in money right are you looking after a full stack of money or you're going to do it differently right um and in that context therefore if i were to wear an accountant's hat and want to look at the value and the chain then you're thinking about both the aspects right what are the linkages in a chain that you need to be worried about which portions are broken or inconsistent or so fragmented that there is potential loss of value yeah so i think what we think about is technology allows us to intervene in in a very differentiated way because you theoretically can do point solutions but you can also sit back and watch what now we call no code low code microservice right i mean the language is actually coming out to be discussed in that manner today because we're not monolith in our approach today that's one important point to note when you use the word full stack it does not necessarily mean that we need to be quote on quote in control of everything but what's important however i think is if you look at the new digital public infrastructure the digital public goods um, architecture that we have in india which is very unique it is that it's root open interoperable and it expects that the world will work with each other it's a very interesting way to think about it it sort of bashes on the whole notion of ip it's exchangeable ip and you get paid for that exchange so everybody's got that but you got to be able to move and in that context when you look at this sector which is agriculture when you say it's multi crop multi location everything is in a multi dimensional 
either problem or a multidimensional state. But here comes, I think, the incredible possibility for teams like whoever we are talking to. And yesterday I was talking to Ranjit and I said, we don't yet have a chief agronomist. We need to have one. He said, I don't think I might not need one. There'll be agronomist entities, actually, right? I might be able to get a startup that could actually assist me or somebody else. But the intent really is the ability to partner more than everything else in an interoperable way. And that is really the fullness of a stack, more than the fact that I must own and control. It is actually knowing what you will control, what you will manage uh, well and best at, and the ability then to, to take off sense from various parts actually becomes interesting. You only think PESA. In our business, in Stellabs, the conversations are all around PESA. There's no rupee. Rupee is much later. 100 PESA makes it a rupee. We think PESA because the belief is that if we can manage every one P at a time, and I was very glad the recent visit that I made to a village. Um, so I asked the guy who was operating the chiller, and we were testing electric vehicles uh, from Euler, where Karthik's an investor. And this is, this is really the beauty that Karthik's investor there, I might not be, but I'm able to take that from him and say, you know, I met him and Ranjit's already got in touch. He says, okay, let's look at it. And the fact that in the village, the guy who was most proudly showing it to me that we are trying this, sir, you know, none of the founders were there. He said, I said, so what is it going to do? He says, sir, I will save 18 paisa per liter of milk. I said, this is it. Because if that guy thinks about 18 paisa, 5 paisa, 8 paisa, then to Yust's point, everybody in the link will work now. The farm, the farmer, uh, the foliage that you're growing, the fuel costs that are there. Every single thing is the fullness of a stack. And I think that's the most exciting part about agriculture. Because while it's very fragmented, that is the opportunity. right? It's not been owned by one person. It's actually co-owned. It's cooperatively run. Uh, and so somebody was asking me on the plane today while I was, I was flying in. And he said, so are you going to disintermediate? You know, is that your objective? I said, in fact, we're just changing the quality of intermediation. We will retain intermediation because we will get them to be value-adding intermediation. And it's a question of literacy. It's a question of you know, cooperation, uh, bringing best of breed together to work in what is a very, very difficult space. Uh, and therefore, you know, when you use the word full stack, for me, it's a multi-dimensional view of that full stack, right? So absolutely, when you look at, for example, geography, once you're trying to get the best extraction from a geography, then I can't just see milk. If there is silk, I have to see milk and silk. Like in Kolar, you have milk and silk, and they, they actually intertwine the two. So the farmers actually earn and they understand the portfolio approach to life. And I think my belief is that we've got to wear the lens, however, very carefully, because you can't do everything. We have an eight hour scale, you know, eight hour into four and a half days uh, is all the Western world has taught me that you should do it, everything in four and a half days, nothing more than that. Get others to specialize, get them to be the best quality in that. And that's how you sort of increase. It's not like because I'm a startup, I've got to work for 24 hours. I have no time and I'm doing everything. I think that's the notion of my full stack, which is partner all the way in as much as you can. Great. Um, I know we're just uh, getting short on time. So, Rem, a uh, quick question. You know, you have seen across the board, uh, the question is, is B2C or a B2B a right model to go with, right? Because both have the uh, challenges and uh, uh, opportunities that come along with it and uh, what you can cause as a disruption within the value chain. Um, how do you look at it, uh, you know, for people who are actually building up solutions right now? Of course, the solutions can be tech enabled or not non-tech enabled as we have seen, but how do you look at things from uh, someone who's uh, trying to build up solutions? Uh, do you think, putting up solutions like what we're seeing on the B2B side where there's a lot of GMB uh, play happening, but uh, do you think there's margins that can be built over a period of time with technology intervention? Or do you think, uh, you know, going with an approach of, uh, again, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, creating models from farm to fork, uh, creating properties or sorry, products uh, from B2C perspective uh, will make sense. So what are your thoughts on that, Rim? 
Listen, I think there are certain ratios you can't change. There's a farm gate ratio, and then there's a point of consumption ratio, and you can't change that. What you can do is change what you're consuming. So for example, there is there is a tomato and then there's a tomato at the farm gate and a tomato on your table. And then there's a ratio in the price that and, and what you can pull out there. You can convert that to ketchup. You can take milk and convert it into paneer, but that's it's still the same thing. So if you're operating in a, in a value chain where there is basically no arbitrage and you need to be a, a billion dollar you know, trader that's moving containers and containers across the seas in order to make, you know, one bip, two bip, then I don't think you should be playing in that space. And there's no point trying to get into that space, drumming up a whole lot of GMV and then trying to convince yourself, investors and the general market that there's some value to be unlocked there. There is none to be unlocked. Um, those are businesses that will always exist and should exist, but do not require an intervention. Where we should be spending our time is in places where there is either um, the the end product uh, can be is is can be in can be changed can be better packaged, but essentially you should only go down that road if you can genuinely um, demonstrate value and demonstrate margins. Uh, I think it's it's we're not fooling anyone if we need to discount safe vegetables to sell them. Um, or we are trying to convince ourselves that there is a educational change that is required that's going to get people to appreciate it over a period of time. That may or may not work. My firm belief is that B2B needs to prove that it can be profitable at some point. I'm not expecting it to be so overnight. But if it can't even be profitable at scale, if the argument is that I can't make money in this value chain unless I, for example, staple on a hundred different things, um, I can't make money trading this commodity. I can make money financing this commodity. Therefore, I will first build a hundred million dollars of GMV and then try and build a bank around it. I'm not sure if that's the logical way to approach these problems. Um, I'm a firm. I'm a, firm, I'm a fan of, of B2B. That's not to say I don't think there's value in B2C. Um, we have taken ex experimental bets in B2C. We have taken real bets in B2C. But I do think B2B in agri is where value can be unlocked truly. Um, I like, you know, when, when Ranjit talks about his, his wholesale milk, when I talk about Ranjit's wholesale milk business, I always say it's from the cow all the way to, to the to the to the wholesale point, but the two things that he doesn't do is brand it and last mile delivery. And I, unfortunately, I think those are the two places where everything sort of falls apart. Um, so yeah, where I, I would say B2B is definitely, it's not easier, but there's true value to be unlocked there. It's also, you're dealing with a finite set of problems as opposed to when you go B2C and you're dealing with dynamics and issues that are, perhaps too many to, to name and number. Right. Um, Achna, I think uh, one question for you. Um, uh, if you look at, sorry. Uh, there are some questions. You, there's an audience questions are there. Maybe we can have yeah. Yust and Archana sort of respond to some of those questions which are there. Would it make sense because there's six minutes to go, five minutes to go. Yeah, yeah I think we should do that. I think uh, I'm just looking at here. Um, um, I think some of them uh, we have tried to answer basically, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, I think we're trying to address some of these questions. Uh, there's a question around, can uh, someone elaborate on the climate tech aspect of agri-tech in India since, uh, you know, Indian agri contributes to 18% of the overall Indian carbon profile due to its uh, agrarian structure. Um, so maybe uh, this is something, uh, I don't know if Archana you can take. Uh, the question is really about, uh, you know, climate tech and uh, the contribution towards uh, um, agri, basically, right? Uh, um, so what do you think about that? And do you think, you know, carbon credits and uh, regenerative agri practices can address some of these uh, challenges? And uh, do we see that it's the right time for India to kind of uh, look into these aspects uh, right now? 
Yeah, um, my knowledge on this candidly is limited because we don't look at climate um, climate tech or climate resilient agriculture uh, as the Gates Foundation. We're more focused on kind of climate adaptation, um, so making farms more climate resilient. Um, so decarbonization, carbon credits, et cetera, is kind of uh, out of scope for us. I haven't looked at that space. Overall, I would say, is it the right time for India? Yes, absolutely. Especially, you know, given the broader context of kind of now India's role in G20, just, you know, taking a more leadership role in some of these, these efforts. Um, in country, you know, things like the ONDC and other public rails that are being built that can have really good impacts for agriculture are really interesting. So is it the right time? Yes, absolutely, to make headway there. Um, what is the right model for decarbonization, um, carbon credits, you know, whether it's regenerative agriculture, et cetera, un unclear that we've seen kind of um, business models that have really gone to scale there. Um, so can't comment on a specific business model. But overall, I would say, um, you know, there's still, so with all of the progress that's been made in Indian, Indian agriculture, and there has been a ton, um, both on the tech innovation side of things and on the public ecosystem side of things, there is still a lot more to be solved. So I think there's still fundamental challenges on access to finance, access to markets, um, you know, helping farmers get the more, more contemporary, more uh, relevant, you know, hybrid inputs, fertilizers, there's there's a lot of those fundamental challenges that remain. Um, so it's not an either or question, but how can we make make progress on both at the same time? I've actually okay. seen uh, uh, I've actually seen Nutrico make a lot of alternate protein bets, uh, one she. So it'll be interesting to see what you start to say. Sure. Just please go ahead. <laughs> Happy to comment and. Um... So we invest in the future of protein, protein, right? And I think the biggest impact on the short term will come from making existing protein production through animals more efficient, right? And I think, frankly, also that's that's where also startups can come in, right? If you increase productivity per cow, right? I think that has a substantial carbon footprint impact also. At the same time, we look for new ways to make protein production more sustainable and efficient, tapping into new sources, right? As, and we go as far as investing also into cultured protein, so taking a cell out of an animal and cultivating it into a bioreactor. And it's not an either or approach, right? I think in order to feed a growing population sustainably, right, we'll need to tap into all the sources that we can get, right? And we have to maximize the efficiency and the sustainability and the resilience of all the food systems that that are part of the of the global chain. So um I would I don't think there's a specific solution for India per se, right? I think this is something that farm, farmers across the world are grappling with, right? How how to improve their practices, make them more sustainable and to get rewarded for it, right? That's that's not an easy puzzle to solve because I think farmers generally have a willingness to do the right thing for the the world and the land that they depend on, right? Um however, they're typically not being rewarded and I think that's the biggest biggest challenge to solve. Um, in in this in this discussion, and I think India will have its have, will have its particular version of that um, of that puzzle, right? But it's not that different from farmers in the Netherlands or the U.S. or Kenya, for that matter. Um, maybe one aspect I hadn't heard in the discussion about B two B versus B two C, right? I think one specific feature of of, aqua, of of agriculture is that distribution is is uh, outrageously expensive to build, right? So I agree with everything that's been said so far about. B2B versus B2C. I don't think one is better or worse than the other, right? I think it depends on what you're trying to solve for. But I think if distribution is there, if your target customer is already being addressed by somebody much larger, right, then B2B makes sense. But if your target customer is not being addressed, in the case of Stellabs, right, these farmers are not being serviced on a larger basis, you have to build a distribution yourself. Well, then you have to look for a model also in which you have more um, features, if you will, to your stack, to borrow Sudhir's phrase, right, in order to justify the cost of building this distribution from scratch. But I think the single bi single biggest factor holding back um, deploying and realizing the value of innovation in, ag in agriculture is the, the inability to scale across infrastructure and distribution, because it's just so hard to reach farmers and to, to transform the value chain in that way. Just my two cents to add to that discussion. Thank you, Jos. And um, I know I think uh, we are running out of time here, so I'll hand it back to Ranjit, um, um, you know, to kind of uh, give the closing remarks. But uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, uh, be here and uh, kind of host you guys and moderate this session. It's been a great learning for me as well. So thank you for being here and uh, back to you, Ranjit. No, thanks, uh, Wamshi, for that um, intriguing discussion. Um, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, Archana used uh, 
uh, Karthik um, and Sudhir, uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, we'll be having more follow on uh, in a, a sessions on other various facets of the ag value chain. Um, it could be financing in the value chain, uh, providing agro inputs, uh, other embedded uh, you know, components, uh, how a tech specifically would play out from a productivity, quality, traceability point of view. So I'd like the audience uh, to stay tuned uh, and I'll hand over the baton to Abhijit of ThinkAg uh, to uh, sign off and take it forward. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sanjeet. I think the discussion was very interesting, very useful. Uh, of course, we had the limitation of time and uh, I would like to thank each and every panelist for this. It was a super discussion and there are a lot of key takeaways from this discussion, which will be circulating to all the attendees as well as people who couldn't make it to uh, the event. Uh, last but not least, I definitely would like to uh, thank the uh, Celabs team. Personally, uh, Ranjit, uh, Rashmi and Pratik ha have actually coordinated very well for this event. Otherwise, putting things together would have been a little difficult. So stay tuned as we continue the series of discussions with Stellabs. And of course, ThinkAg has been hosting such uh, webinars. So please be a part of our future events too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it'll be helpful for you to kind of uh, at least uh, get some questions from the chat, which we are not able to cover and uh, answer that on the chat um, or, you know, even forward these questions to uh, some of us so that we can actually revert on that. Uh, because sure. it, and the time sure. we were not able to cover any of that. So sure. hundred percent. We'll do that. Sure. Thank you. guys. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you for this. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.